Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Katrina, and thanks again for NAB for supporting this event. I'm one of those six people as part of the Dandelion program working at NAB, so woohoo, that's awesome. <laughs> it's great to be here today sharing in this event. My name is Joe Bindley, and I'm a security analyst with DXC working at NAB. I work in the identity and access management team. And it's my pleasure to introduce our first keynote presenter for this summit. John Marble is the founder of Pivot Neurodiversity and is a writer and speaker on innovation, autism, and neurodiversity. In 2009, he was appointed by President Barack Obama to the United States Office of Personal, Personnel Management. There, his work focused on workforce development, innovation, and incorporating into government services the best practices and thinking of Silicon Valley. In addition to his White House service, he has served as an advisor and aide to Secretary Hillary Clinton, Senator John Kerry, and Vice President Al Gore. I encourage you to learn more about John from his bio. Please join me in welcoming John, who has traveled all the way from the US to share with us today. Thank you. Just give me a second. Thank you for that introduction, Joe. I really appreciate that. Oh. 10 years ago, I would not be standing on the stage. And 10 years from now, I should not. While there are many people and programs and things that got me here today, I really have to credit the vision and the leadership and the persistence of one person. And that's my former boss, President Barack Obama. And what will determine whether or not I return here in 10 years' time will be due to the vision and persistence and leadership of one group, and that's you. It might sound a bit odd that I'm asking for your help <laughs> to make sure that I'm not coming back in 10 years' time. I'm happy to come back next year. <laughs> Everybody has certainly been welcoming. I've loved Australia. Thank you for everything. Thank you for the Tim Tams. They're wonderful. <laughs> and teaching me how to Tim Tam slam. <laughs> but I do want your help in making sure that I'm not here 10 years from now. And if you give me a bit of your patience and a little bit of your time, I'm happy to explain why. Some of you here may be familiar with autism. Some of you not so much at all. You might be parents of autistic children. You may be service providers. You might be autistic yourself. Or you could be managers and colleagues of autistic people, or potential managers and colleagues of autistic people. Whatever your experience, whatever your role here today, whatever prompted you to get up this morning, to get into the shower, to get dressed, to drive in, to take the tram, to walk, whatever prompted you to sit in this seat I hope that it can explain a bit of a future vision that we can all work in together. So one of the things I do that Joe mentioned is I, uh, is this still working here? I uh, think and I write and I speak on autism. So I think about autism all the time, particularly as it relates to autistic employment. I've surveyed everything, I've crunched all the data and I can tell you that the state of autism and autistic employment generally is abysmal. It's horrific. It's dim. And that cuts all sorts of ways. One of the things about doing this work is I've become particularly passionate and quite angry about what parents go through, parents of autistic kids. And think about it. If you're a parent and your child is diagnosed with autism, you're given very little information you maybe face this mountain of scientific information that often conflicts with each other. 
And that, more often than not, is coupled with pseudoscientific information as well. So apart from taking care of your child and your other children and yourself, you have to sift through all of this to figure out what makes sense for you. Maybe you get your child into a program. Maybe you don't have access to that. Whether or not, you're not provided the support that you need. If you're a service provider, you're in the same boat. And that's regardless of whether or not your service organization is fully funded or is struggling for money. The truth is that the information that you get about autism is, tends to be a bit outdated, a bit incorrect, a bit built on assumptions that lead you astray. And so without that information and without that support, you're probably frustrated at the amount of outcomes that you can achieve. If you're autistic yourself, you know this well enough. Autistic people are generally not understood. We used to do a really good job, which turned out to be a horrible job, about teaching autistic kids how to mirror non-autistic kids. Autistic kids could get pretty good at that. But it turned out that wasn't what was beneficial for them. In society, we generally do not teach autistic children or adults who they are how they think, how they process the world. And we don't teach them how non-autistic people think and experience the world. And therefore, we don't teach them the appropriate navigations and translation and second language that they might need to integrate themselves into society. And if you're a manager or a colleague of an autistic person, you have to deal with all of this, <laughs> and I'm sorry that this is the front end that you have to deal with, but it's the product of where we are. So apart from autism, I know that sounds a bit bleak, sorry. <laughs> it sounds a bit bleak, but it's actually a great thing because we're in this wonderful moment where we can shape the future so it's gonna get hopeful. I don't want you to be <laughs> totally down about this. But I think about this dichotomy between things about how things are and how they could be. I do that with autism. I also do that with the future of work. How work is changing. It's why I work in Silicon Valley. How everything is shifting. How what's required of us today will not be what is required with us tomorrow. And if you think about your current state of work, we probably also feel the same thing. We're probably all exhausted. We all feel taxed in our job. We all feel like we have to do more with less resources. And if you don't, please tell me where you work. I might want a job there. It sounds great. But that's the state of where we are. And the truth is, those pressures will continue to advance. In San Francisco, I'm on the advisory board of a group called the American Artificial Intelligence Forum. I don't particularly know a lot about artificial intelligence, but I know how people work and how technology and processes shape our work, which is why I'm on the advisory board. And one of the things that I've learned being on the American AI Forum advisory board is that our perceptions of artificial intelligence tends to be wrong as, the, uh, as members of the public. We kind of think about these artificial intelligence robots coming to take our jobs, but that's not particularly the case. Instead, what will happen is we'll slowly see aspects of our work shift to become automated. And we have to be nimble and flexible enough to adapt to new ways of doing things. And that can be a great thing. One of the advantages of that is we have an opportunity to make a more equitable workforce, a more inclusive workforce, to not just think about how artificial intelligence and technology shapes our work, but how our own attitudes and approaches and management shape that work as well. Also sounds a little bit daunting, but it's a good thing, I promise you. But this is the sort of thing I think on now in Silicon Valley, and this is the sort of thing that, um, did you wanna just go ahead and cut this mic off so it doesn't bring? So this is the sort of thing that uh, I think about now in Silicon Valley, not just autism, but the future of work, how work is changing, what all those implications mean. And it's what President Obama asked me to do when I had the privilege of being appointed by the White House to the Office of Personnel Management. 
And it started off, that wasn't my background. My background was in mass communications, how we communicate with people, but I always loved solving wicked problems. And so President Obama came to our team and he said, John, to be fair, my boss's name was John and he said it to him, but my, bo <laughs> my boss passed it along. By the way, that boss was wonderful. Uh, the Honorable John Barry, he would eventually become uh, President Obama's ambassador to Australia, and I sorely regret not visiting while my former boss uh, was an ambassador here. It would have been a great trip. Um, but he said, uh, John, I want you and your team to make government cool again. That was the directive. What does that mean? Uh, that was the directive. But what he meant by that, because he had the vision and the foresight and the persistence, was we have a federal workforce of about two million people in the United States, a civilian workforce. And it was an aging workforce. And it was a system built where if you started your career, you expected to work the next 40 years for that particular agency or job and then retired. But it turned out that that's not how reality works for most companies. It certainly wasn't how millennials wanted to work. So we had this desperate need to attract millennials to federal service. So I went with my colleague, Matt Collier, who now works in Singapore. And starting in 2009, 10 years ago, we made repeated trip after trip to Silicon Valley. We studied Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, all sorts of companies that millennials were flocking to people who maybe wanted to work a job two years, three years max, and then move on, which was so foreign to us in DC. And so we wanted to see what was attracting millennials to this and what we could extrapolate um, in innovation and workplace practices for the federal government. We learned such great things, such great things. We took that information, brought it back to DC, uh, went to the basement of our agency, uh, took out an old call center, and built an innovation lab. And we had great success. Department of Agriculture came in, saved $200 million. Another agency came in, saved $50 million. We cut rate tape. We kept processes. It was a success. And from that, the White House Innovation Fellows were started. And we also incorporated innovation labs into almost every agency in the federal government. Learned lots of great things from Silicon Valley, but there's always a but. <laughs> but each time I would go to Silicon Valley, I would tend to meet with a company, and I would say, thank you for all of this practice on innovation. Thank you. But I noticed looking at your data, the women in your company are not being promoted to management at the same rate as men. And actually, it's a pretty big artificial gap there's something that's blocking that. What are you doing to solve for that? We're trying to solve for that in a particular couple of pockets in the federal government, and I'm desperate for models. And the response would tend to be the same. What are you talking about? We're open for anybody. Anybody can work here. But the problem was is that most companies in Silicon Valley are started by a couple of guys who go to three or four schools, who hire three or four people who went to school with them, who hire 10 people and 20 people. And eventually, you have a 500,000, 2,000 person company where everybody looks the same. And so our government scientists were freaking out, as I was, because we could see the artificial drag that this was having, not only on Silicon Valley's output, but on our national economy as well. So I was desperate to solve for that. And I was thinking deeply on this when I returned from a trip in Silicon Valley. And Andrew, I apologize. You've heard this story like three times this week. But I returned from a trip from Silicon Valley. And the deputy director of White House personnel, Dave Noble, asked me to lunch. And not only did he ask me to lunch, he asked me to lunch in the White House mess, which is right next door to the Situation Room. And to be asked to lunch at the White House mess is a privilege. I worked for the White House for seven years. I went to the White House mess once, and that was for this time. Usually I had to be a cabinet secretary or an ambassador or vice president to eat there. So it's a privilege when you're asked to eat lunch there. When the deputy director of the Office of White House Personnel, who manages all of the president's appointments, asks you to lunch there, it usually means one of two things. One, you're getting a promotion. 
Two, you're getting fired. <laughs> and it's a nice departing gift. Thank you for your service. I appreciated your time. Enjoy this lunch. Good luck on your future endeavors. It turned out I was not getting fired. Unfortunately, at the time, I was not getting a promotion as well. But uh, it turned out Dave just was interested in my work and wanted to catch up. And so we're talking, had a great lunch. And there came a moment at the end of the lunch that really changed my life and really helped me to understand neurodiversity. And some of you know this. I said, Dave, I have to tell you something. And only my parents know, and my doctor, and my best friend. But I'm autistic. And I've struggled my entire life to hide it. And I've struggled to make my own accommodations. And I'm really proud of the fact that I've made my own accommodations. But it's gotten to the point at my work that I need to ask my manager for a small accommodation. And I don't know how. It got dead quiet. It felt like my heart stopped. It felt like about 10 minutes went on. It was probably about a quarter second, but it felt like 10 minutes. More nervous than I'd ever been in my life, apart from right now. But his response changed my life. I sat there in silence, and Dave turned to me and said, John, that's fantastic. You're autistic. I have no idea to this day what kind of look I gave him at the time, but I'm sure it was like horror and confusion because he prompted me at that moment. He said, John, have you never thought about autism, that it might have been a help to you in your career? I said, no, of course not. Because up until that point, my entire life, I had felt shame. He said, John, come on, think about it. It's like, I've known you a long time. And it's true, he was a former boss of mine in a previous job. And he, we were close enough that he could say, you're definitely an odd guy. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that's true. He's like, but you think about things differently. It's like, think about the projects that we worked on in our previous job. And think about what you work on now. He said, look, John, it's my job as deputy director here to look throughout all of America for the top people to recommend to the president that he appoints. And I am constantly not only looking for the best people, but the most diverse group of people. Because if I have a bunch of smart people in a room, and if they all are the same, the problem that they're solving isn't going to get the answer that we need. We need a diverse group of people to look at things from different perspectives. So yeah, I will help you get your accommodation. I'll, talk, I'll help you navigate that with your manager. And to this day, I can't even remember what that accommodation was. I think it took like 30 seconds. Um, but I remember how he made me feel and what he said to me. He said, I will help you get your accommodation, but I need you to accept yourself for who you are. I need you to figure that out. And then at that point, I need you to lean into who you are, because we need that at work. We don't need somebody who's hiding. That was some really tough love that he gave me, but I, it was the tough love that I needed. And from that point on, my role at work began to shift. Again, my role was mass communications. It was innovation. It was workforce policy. It was how to make a more equitable workforce, not only for the federal government, but to model it for the private sector. Yet something interesting happened. As soon as I accepted that I was autistic, and as soon as I realized that, oh yeah, maybe I see things a little bit differently than most of my colleagues. And what happened was, Almost unconsciously, I began to be pulled into meetings that I, of subjects that I knew nothing about. One was about Ebola. And it looked like it was about to jump the Atlantic. And we were trying to figure out, how do we stop Ebola from jumping the Atlantic? The other was, we've got a lot of ticked off Americans with our security lines at the airport. And they're demanding shorter time at security but we want to keep or increase the level of security that we enforce. It was all sorts of things. It was how do we respond to this intrusion by a, former government, by a foreign government who's launching a cyber attack on us. All of these things I had no portfolio knowledge about. I had no training about. 
but I became a benefit when I'm pulled into those meetings simply because I had a different point of view. And I wish I could tell you it was autism magic, <laughs> but we're, we're not some magical creatures. We're normal people just like everybody else who experience the world a little bit differently. And while it's true we have unique strengths that often play out at work, we tend to be really good at pattern recognition, the biggest benefit I had was simply being different than a homogenous group, and that made all of the difference. So I left the White House, and the good thing about working for the president in a second term is that you know when the president's job is gonna end, yours will as well. Uh, autistic people tend not to do that well with change, so I had a pretty, once the president was reelected, I'm like, okay, I got four years to figure this out. Um, and I went to friends and they helped me figure this out, and the White House was very gracious with his appointees and helping them figure that out. I knew I needed to go to Silicon Valley because it just drove my passion about this artificial drag that Silicon Valley was creating by the lack of diversity. So after the Obama administration, I moved to Silicon Valley. And naively, I thought there would be thousands of people coming to work on this problem in, to help Silicon Valley clean up its culture, um, become more diverse. It turned out not so much. <laughs> it was like me and a couple other people. And because I'm autistic, I can say all of my colleagues who worked for the White House knew how to parlay that experience into great jobs. Uh, it's a pretty good thing to have on your resume <laughs> to say that you worked for the President of the United States. But when we're talking about themes for this year's summit, we're talking about transitions, and that really resonated with me because I've noticed over and over and over again that autistic people can get really good at the job at, in front of us, but navigating the transition to something else can be extremely difficult. Uh, so I moved to San Francisco, had a bit of savings, uh, when I was at university, I worked in a warehouse and I worked in construction building buildings. So immediately, that's where my brain went. Immediately took a minimum wage job in a warehouse on an assembly line. Um, meanwhile, a month later, I'm getting calls from tech companies on my lunch break asking for my advice and I'm giving away free advice. And it took a friend pulling me out of that warehouse to say, John, I think you might have some skills that go beyond the warehouse. I said, but I'm getting really good <laughs> at, these, at these repetitive tasks, and I think I've increased productivity on my line by 30%. <laughs> I did, 35%. Um, <laughs> but it was soothing to have like, this repetitive task for me, and it was soothing to have that security. He said, John, you need to push yourself. So I did. I started interviewing, getting frustrated that I would get interviews for jobs in Silicon Valley that I was way overqualified for, but I would fail the phone screenings. And I couldn't figure out why. And eventually, I figured out that, oh, the pressures that the phone screeners have and their questions that they're asking for people, I'm like giving a deep level answer. And that's not what they need. They're just reading a script and looking to see if I had the right words. So as soon as I figured out that formula, I started passing the phone screeners. And it made me really, really mad that that was the case. So around the same time, I found a, a training program, much akin to Dandelion and Untapped, that was training autistic people for the workplace and helping them understand themselves. And apart from me and my experience, I can tell you that autistic employment in the United States is horrendous. It's horrendous here. Uh, the statistic that I've heard is about 30 to 40% of autistic people have had any sort of work in the previous year in Australia. In the United States, that's 13%. And it's been 13% for a decade and for 15 years. And that's where I stopped looking at the data. But my hunch is if I look back more, it would go on longer. Um, so I knew that this program was teaching these autistic people not only how to transition to work, how to do a resume, how to understand the culture, but it was teaching them who they were as autistic people. And that lit me up. And I said, that's a difference that I haven't seen. I need to be involved in that. So I did, and had a wonderful experience training autistic people. But then something um, happened that further changed my career. I looked back and realized that my biggest regret at the White House was not recognizing myself and accepting myself as autistic early on and leaning into that. My second biggest, by the way, is I went to a Kylie Minogue concert in DC and she mentioned, oh, it's so great to be here in Washington. 
earlier today, I went with the Australian embassy to the White House. And I called the White House and I said, don't ever let Kylie Minogue come to the White House without letting me know. <laughs> <laughs> that was my second biggest regret. But my biggest regret was not, under, it's a deeply felt one. Um, but my biggest regret was not understanding myself and how to lean into that work. So working in the warehouse, starting to teach these, uh, I call them kids, but they range from 18 to 39. Some of them had no university experience at all. Some of them had two PhDs but couldn't figure out how to interview. I realized that there was also something more that needed to be done, and it's what the UNTAP program, the Dandelion program does. And that's working on the culture within these companies as well. Because not only was I experiencing autism, I was experiencing the future of work, and I started to see, oh, there's this nice mesh together. And something beautiful happens when I go into companies and I train them on, uh, if you're a manager of an autistic person or colleague, we do these five or six hour deep management trainings. And there's always this beautiful aha moment with managers where they say, oh, aha. Maybe they don't actually say it. Um, <laughs> It seems like what you're teaching us isn't just applicable to managing autistic people. It's like, that seems just like good practices for everybody. And I was like, yes, I didn't want to tell you that. I wanted you to discover it for yourself. Um, and then sometimes they say, hmm, I wonder if that's why women keep leaving my team and our companies. I wonder if that's why we can't attract people of color and people from other regions. And it's why it is. People tend to think of us at work as kind of the um, hard case. And I like to show us as like the hard case is the utter boring normalcy of disability and autism continues to astound me. Disabled people are just plain and ordinary and boring. Some of us can do extraordinary things, but just by being disabled ourselves, by being autistic ourselves, there's nothing special about that. But we do tend to develop different ways of communicating, and we have different ways of thinking, and we need that integration to better understand our managers and for our managers to understand us. And I found that the practices that you can develop with autistic employees to make them thrive really make everybody thrive. We desire structure, clarity, understanding the context between our work and the output. We desire a lot of things that it turns out it's really good for other people as well. And the truth is, at least in the United States, we don't really manage anymore. Managers are under too much pressure that they don't have time to manage. And so when we teach people how to manage autistic people and start to make those approaches more universal, it turns out it has this huge benefit for all employees as well. So that's great. Um, we've had this modular success in the United States. There's success that's happening in um, Australia as well. But when I think about uh, the larger ecosystem and what's going on, I continue to get frustrated. Why isn't this happening more? Why isn't this happening more? And I know parents are frustrated. I know service organizations are frustrated. Certainly, I know autistic people are frustrated. Um, and we need to fix that. So I did a survey of the United States looking for desperately for partners to see who was doing this well. And every time that I would go to a company to train them, they would pull me aside and say, so now I can fill that in because I know exactly what they're saying. There's like, so I'm like, you think you have employees here who are autistic or otherwise neurodiverse? but you don't know if they know, and you don't know if they know that you know, and you don't know what to talk about, and you're afraid of all sorts, and they're like, yes. <laughs> like, like, we have the, this one employee, or these three employees, maybe one of them are underperforming, but they're brilliant, how do I keep them, how do I motivate them? So I started to realize, like, oh, there's an opportunity here. And I would start getting asked questions over and over again. Who does a really good scrub of our hiring system to see if we're being equitable for neurodiverse people? What about our office? Is it sensory friendly? What about our policies for new employees? What about our culture? What about our benefit packages for parents who might have autistic kids? Are we meeting their needs? And so for a while, my response, they would ask me, like, who is working on this? And for a while, my response was, eh, and this person here is kind of, this person here is kind of, but no one really. 
And then I started to realize, oh, I have some expertise here. But more importantly than that, I know brilliant autistic people who are systems designers, product designers, policy experts, but don't know how to interview and get a job. And I know allies and parents who are as well. So I started to build this Nebula network. Um, and I went to my friend Josh, who's a venture capitalist, because that's a weird thing that you can say in Silicon Valley. Um, Josh also has an autistic brother, and he's a good friend of mine. And I said, Josh, I think companies are wanting me to help them, and I think they want to give me money, but I don't know. What am I supposed to do? I was like in this panic. It's like, OK, calm down. Let's sit down, and let's have a talk. It turned out he ran me through an exercise. I just thought we were having a talk. And he said, John, what do you ultimately want? It's like, for me or my business? He was like, no, just ultimately, what do you want? And I said, Josh, I want a world where autistic people are accepted and accommodated as normal. He said, great, what's preventing that? Well, autistic people aren't at the center of our own narrative and conversation. If there's an autism organization, we're not on the board. We're not on the staff. If there's a tech product built for us, we're not designing it with the designers. If there's curriculum for us, we're not designing it as well. So there's a lot of these assumptions that happen. But without our input, those false assumptions add up on top of themselves. And all of a sudden, you've spent several million, if not $100 million, over the course of years to provide solutions that don't actually benefit us. It's like, well, that sounds like a pretty good problem to solve. He said, how are you going to solve for that? <laughs> it's like, how am I going to solve for that? It's like, well, your chunk. How is your piece going to solve for that? And I said, well, I know these brilliant autistic people, and I know these brilliant parents who have this experience. And I know that we can provide the solutions that are better for us because we're at the center of that narrative. And if I can provide those solutions, and if we can have success, then I can model that upwards. And I can start to demonstrate why autistic people should be at the center of solutions for us. And we can make the case of why we should be included. He said, great, start for that. Unfortunately, my business model is not a venture capital business model. But fortunately, venture capitals, capitalists, it's not a venture capitalist model. We'll give you all sorts of free advice as long as they're not giving you their money. <laughs> uh, and Josh has been incredibly uh, gracious with that. So a lot of that is what we've been working on. I started a company called Pivot, Pivot Neurodiversity, which is helping companies support their existing neurodiverse employees, helping them to point to trusted partners like you have here with the Dandelion program and in Tapped here the partners that we trust in the United States. And that's the sort of thing that I'm working on. Unfortunately, I, I told Andrew that I think he's wasted his money flying me out here. Thank you so much for that, by the way. Um, because what I specialize in are those hard problems, and particularly diagnosing something and providing a prescription and saying what's wrong. And in the United States, with a lot of autistic employment pro programs, there's a lot of things wrong. That's my expertise. But what I've seen here in Australia has astounded me. I've really been shocked. In the Dandelion program, in the Untap program, at NAB, at ANZ, at the places that we've gone, I've seen autistic people at the table. I've seen parents with them at the table. I've seen autistic people designing the curriculum for autistic people. I've seen autistic people working as managers, as mentors, and that's making all the difference. So at the next United States Autism Outwork Summit, I hope a lot of you will come and help me share with those companies in the United States the models that you've learned here. Because the two main things that I've found to make these successful programs is integration of autistic people and understanding of us and more open communication. I can tell you with the uh, untapped program with NAB and ANZ, I was astonished that you have these uh, three-year pods of new employees that you bring into the company. And that's great. In the United States, that's usually where it stops. And now companies are struggling with, uh-oh, it's been about three years. These people are wanting to grow and move on. What do we do here? 
but you have that foresight here. And I likened it earlier today to like when you're a kid and you go to the fair or the store and get a goldfish in a little baggie and you bring it home and the person says, well, before you put it in the bowl, just put it in the baggie in the bowl and let it acclimate. And then you can open up the baggie and let it out. And when I see these programs here, that's the model that I see. It's not keeping these autistic employees in that baggie for their entire life. It's helping them accommodate to integrate to be in the workforce just like their other peers and then letting them out. And then I was at ANZ yesterday. They have other avenues as well. We met with an employee who just came in through the regular door. There are other employees who come in through their uh, tech grad doors. Autistic people come in all shapes and sizes. By the way, 25% of us are nonverbal and people tend to dismiss those people. I have friends who are nonverbal who are more brilliant and more talented than me. And it frustrates me endlessly that people don't see their talents. So I don't want you to think that I'm the only autistic representative here. But it's such a wonderful model to actually have us at the table, to have our families at the table to design these solutions. It makes it better for everyone. And as I think about the future of work, not only is it making it better for autistic people, it's really approaches that make us more nimble and more communicative and more accessible for all of our work as well. And that's really the power there. So I know I started off with this daunting thing at the beginning, talking about the miserable state of autism, and it is. But what a privilege we have to be at this point, to make a difference, to change how we work, not just for autistic people, but for all of us. One of the most wonderful things about being autistic is realizing that autism was just beyond, was something that was beyond just my diagnosis. That having to live in this world that's not designed for me, that there were other people out there doing this life experience as well. And so the more I've connected with autistic people, I started to realize there's this shared language. There's this shared culture. There's consensus, there's community, and that's a wonderful thing. Autistic people are represented in all walks of life. I think about people who are deep thinkers on a whole variety of subjects. Amy Sequenza is a nonverbal autistic who does brilliant thinking on autism and employment. Finn Gardner, who thinks about language and how to make fonts more accessible. I think about Sarah Luderman, uh, who is just one of the most brilliant women that I know and could pretty much solve any issue that you give her, but I'm thankful that she's helping to solve solutions for autism. I think about Ari Neiman, uh, who I have to give credit to because sometimes people introduce me as uh, President Obama's first autistic employee. Um, technically, that's true, but Ari was appointed ahead of me uh, to an advisory board for the federal government. Um, I was there a few months earlier, but I wasn't out. So I will give Ari that credit, but what a difference it would have made if I was comfortable and if I was out. I think about Maxfield Sparrow, who's a transgender autistic man in Colorado, working with National Geographic on a news story, brilliant. He lives in his van because he struggles to find employment and housing, but is one of the most brilliant thinkers that I know. I think about Judy Singer here in Australia who coined the term neurodiversity, um, and I'm so thankful for that, and it's a term that I would never thought that I would understand myself. I think about Moriniki Giwa Uwanawu, who thinks about autism from diverse perspectives. These are all people who are just deep thinkers on autism who happen to be autistic. Then I think about the doers. I think about Ryan Fenn in New York, who's a fashion vlogger, who I watched her coming out video on autism, and it was, I couldn't understand it, not because uh, of uh, anything that she was saying as an autistic person, but because I wasn't a 21-year-old, and I had no idea what she was talking about. When she said, so guys, yeah, so I'm like hella autistic. <laughs> and like, but she's this African-American young woman in the fashion industry in New York sharing her experiences. Greta Thunberg who's leading 1.7 million people in protests the other week, 16 years old in Sweden. She had this beautiful photo with my former boss, President Obama, a black and white photo, and it was meant to show kind of two generations of leaders. This 
an older African-American man and this younger 16-year-old Swedish girl. And she's autistic, and he's looking at her, and she's looking this way. <laughs> And it's beautiful because eye contact is painful for a lot of us. It's physically painful. And when we don't look at you, oftentimes that means we're paying attention. I think of Sydney Magruder, who's a ballerina in New York City and autistic. Juan Pablo Ruiz, who's a biologist. My friend Eric, who's a reporter for Roll Call. I think about a woman named Ken Folk, who runs an organization um, in San Francisco, in Oakland, called Spectrum Queer Media. And I joined it because I thought it was a Facebook group for queer autistic people. Turned out it was not. <laughs> um, but it was this vibrant online community, an in-person community for LGBT people of color that had walks and discussions and whole vibrant culture. And so I messaged Kinfolk and I said, by the way, I love this Facebook group. Um, it wasn't what I thought it was. I'm white. Can I still follow it? And she said, yeah, of course you can. I said, by the way, I'm just curious. Why did you add spectrum to it? She said, oh, well, part, I'm a black woman, yes, but I'm also autistic. And I thought it was a nice homage to my autism. This has nothing to do with autism. This is a service that she's providing for her African American and Latino communities but she happens to be autistic. I think of the Autistic Self Advocacy Network in the United States with its executive director, Julie Bascom. Here in Australia, there's a version of the Autistic Self Advocacy Network too, where autistic people are running our own organizations, lobbying our own governments, and pressing for policies from our perspective. I think of the Autistic Women's Alliance that just launched in Silicon Valley. Carrie Hall, who came in through SAP's Autism at Work program and is an employee there, along with our friend Cassandra Nelson, who's an autistic woman, mother of three, and an entrepreneur. And they got together and said, you know what? We're tired of waiting for our own supports. Let's build them ourselves. So let's build a network for autistic women and non-binary people where we can mentor each other and we can grow each other. I think of my friend Chris at Square, who when I went to go speak at Square a year ago, in the three weeks between they announced me coming to Square to talk about neurodiversity and when I actually showed up, they had eight people on their Slack channel identify themselves as autistic or otherwise neurodiverse. So when I showed up at Square to give this talk, they're like, yeah, 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 that's nice. We're ready to form an autistic or neurodiversity employee resource group. Who does that really well? said, so you want to be the first? <laughs> so they were. They formed an employee resource group. And then they found employees who were parents, employees who were otherwise neurodiverse. And there became this beautiful, ooh, trying not to use that Silicon Valley word, synergy, but this beautiful <laughs> synergy between the two groups. Because all of a sudden, you had autistic employees who somehow found their way into work without a program having a group of employees who are parents who kind of got them on a deeper level than their other employees. And then you had this group of parents who had this group of autistic employees who got them on a deeper level than other employees. So now Square's been promoting that. December will be Neurodiversity Month at Square, and they're looking for um, neurodiverse business owners who use Square and use it in their daily life. I said, by the way, you don't have to wait for December. African American History Month, Women's History Month, LGBT History Month, we're represented in all of those groups. And they said, oh yeah, of course. Let's chase after that. So there's lots and lots of autistic people doing brilliant work. Uh, Beth Radulski uh, at La Trobe University, uh, gracious enough to host Andrew and I the other day. Um, not only are you doing research, but you're teaching. And the most touching moment of that day is when you had your STEM toy at the end and said, I'm just open and honest with my students that I STEM, I am autistic. There's nothing wrong with that. That was, I hate using the word inspiration, but that was an inspirational moment for me. Autumn O'Connor, who's working with Untapped, Untapped, the fact that you're autistic and a psychotherapist, but the fact that you're autistic in designing curriculum for autistic people, it's something I'm desperate for in the United States. And it's not just because of the ethics, which ethically we should be at the center of our own conversations, but it's because of the effectiveness. And I know, I know we're meeting tomorrow to go over your curriculum, but I already know it's gonna be more impactful than I can even imagine, simply because you are there. So that was a lot.
<laughs> and we think about autism, I'm also constantly thinking about the future of work. So if you do want to be prepared for the future, if you want to be prepared for the future of work and how it's going to change, or you simply want to make a more accessible, equitable workforce, I really encourage you to do two things. One, take advantage of all the tools and information that are going to be provided here today. There's a lot of great stuff. Connect with the people here. Connect with UNTAP if you're just curious. If you're doing an employment uh, program, connect with other companies to learn from them. If you're autistic, let's connect with each other. And let's also connect with people who are uh, neurodiverse otherwise or simply neurotypical. And beyond that, just today, I want you to ask yourself, OK, am, am I prepared for the shifting nature of work? I know I'm going to be asked to work differently. I don't know what that means. But I know it's going to take new management approaches, new ways of communicating. So I need, know I need to update that. Maybe I can practice that with autistic people about being more direct, more clear, more accommodating, more flexible in how I work with autistic people so I can be more flexible um, in my work itself. So 10 years ago, I would not be standing on this stage. And it really did take the vision and leadership and persistence of that one person, President Barack Obama. And 10 years from now, I should not be standing on this stage. Joe should be standing. Beth should be standing. Autumn, thousands of other people should be standing here. And the work that you do, what you do from here on out, will determine if I'm still like the only autistic who likes to go around and give talks, or if there'll be other people discovered that we have no idea about. If it might be that person who's working in the car wash that's uh, and now working with Shane in cybersecurity. There's so many autistic people out there with so little opportunities, but such brilliant talent. So I really encourage you to look for those avenues to make it accessible for them today. Thank you.